It's a Sunday after Easter. Some call it Low Sunday, but not at Lemire Church. We're glad you're here to worship with us today. I'm Ed Tomlinson, the pastor. pray together. Loving God, you've ordered this wondrous world. You care for all things in heaven and on earth. At all times and in all seasons, you're with us. On this Sunday after Easter, we rejoice in the victory of our Lord and pray that Sundays to come may be little Easter's where we're reminded of your gift of new life. Thank you, God, for hope and your generous grace. Lord, while we try to do these things which will mitigate the spread of this malicious virus, we thank you for some improvement 
and ask you for the determination and fortitude to do our part. You made us free and given us a sense of responsibility. Help us to exercise both in wisdom. We pray for healing of those who are ill. We ask for stamina for those who work long hours to care for the sick. Guard, O oh Lord, all those who offer medical assistance. Protect those who make food and life's necessities available. Keep safe all emergency personnel and security providers. In your wisdom, show us the way beyond this dilemma to a healthier and brighter tomorrow. This morning, we think about our brothers and sisters in the faith around the world, starting just up the street here in coming. Then we lift up Pastor Sam and our sister congregation in Africa. Keep them safe and encourage each one. Lord, across all the years of our lives, you've been faithful to us. Cause us now more than ever to praise you and trust you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my strength, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, in helpless faith, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on the cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on whom was laid. Our scripture lesson for today comes from the Gospel of John, beginning there in the 20th chapter and the 13th verse. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They've taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they've laid him. 
When she had said this, she turned around and, and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabunai, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Thanks and praise be to God for the glorious word, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. It was the morning of the resurrection, and Mary Magdalene made it to the tomb before sunrise. She saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb and assumed that they had taken our Lord. While Peter and John had rushed into the empty tomb, she stood there weeping. The angels asked her why she wept. She told them of her fear that he had been removed from the tomb. Upon answering them, Jesus asked her, why are you weeping? She thought he was the gardener and asked if he had carried away our Lord. Where have you laid him? You recall that Jesus in a voice that she would recognize said, Mary. And quickly she responded, Rabunai, teacher. Then she asked, then he asked her to go and tell the others. She went with haste and shouted the news, I've seen the Lord, I've seen the Lord. Now John's gospel doesn't tell us whether she saw the gardener, who she thought was Jesus, as she left the garden to spread the news. In fact, there's no further mention of this particular gardener in all the Bible. What happened to him? Certainly John would not have included him in the gospel if he didn't exist. We don't know his name. We do have some idea what he did. But what happened to him? Big deal, you're thinking. This guy is small potatoes. Now, wait a minute. Didn't our relationship with God begin in a beautiful garden? God had grown. God created us for fellowship with our creator, the gardener. God gave Adam the responsibility of tending the garden. Genesis tells us that Adam and Eve took walks with God, God in the garden in the cool of the evening. And this confusion of thinking that Jesus is the gardener, well, it may not be as strange as we think. But let's set that aside a moment and come back to it. Isn't it true that most people who term themselves gardeners take some pride in the work they do? I can't imagine that the gardener to whom Mary referred had worked hard um, hours joining hands with God to create a place of beauty. The serious gardener gets really attached to his or her garden. I can remember when my dad was a district superintendent that uh, when it came to appointment making time, some pastors would, would tell him that they didn't want to move away from their gardens. And to be honest with you, early in my ministry, I reluctantly left some nice gardens as well. There are several truths about gardening that are clearly relatable to our expressions of faith, to our lives together in the church. I love that gardening quote. A person of words and not deeds is like a garden full of weeds. If you planted a garden, you're well aware that its surroundings make a difference. You turn the soil, you plan where you will plant, you have a design in mind. Even if you don't garden, I will assure you that some of your grandparents or great-grandparents were, were farmers or, or gardeners. 
Many of us can remember our grandparents spending hours every day tending a garden, a vegetable garden and our flower garden. I would watch and sometimes help my grandmother get the rows straight and plant seeds and pull weeds. As a child, it was exciting for me to watch the plants break the soil. Lettuce, beans, corn, carrots, peas, squash, and, and on and on. And I learned some basic lessons that have helped me garden across a lifetime. For instance, bury your tomato plants until you can only see the very tops because it enhances their root structure and usually makes for more productive plants. It was clear that unless one planted in a greenhouse, there would be weeds and grass and even briars that would infest the garden. They would destroy or restrict the growth of the good plants. Hence all the cultivation and weeding and fertilization was so important for the best results. Yes, God created a world filled with plants of numerous varieties, some useful and some of little use, some harmful. God also made a, a curious variety of people. That's a fact that we must take into account in the church. God made some excellent planters. To others, God gave the gift of cultivation. Even the capacity of fertilization is granted to some. To still others, skill in gathering or harvesting is their gift. Then some find themselves tending to uproot or hamper growth are destroyed by neglect. You see, the church is not a greenhouse which keeps a perfect environment. Rather, it's an environment where thorns in the hands of a risen Savior can be changed into something productive. The gardener at the garden tomb, where Jesus had been laid, had done his work and found affirmation in how he had worked with God. Well, we still wonder where he was on that resurrection morning. Was he hiding? There was turmoil all about. The soldiers had been in the garden watching, gardening, guarding the tomb. For his own safety, was he keeping his distance? We can identify with that over the past few weeks, can't we? Maybe it was too early for him to, to come to work. John's Gospel tells us that Mary Magdalene got there before daybreak. With all the uncertainty, he may not have slept well the night before. Or was he about gathering what he needed to do his work? No doubt there was some damage to the garden when that heavy stone was rolled back. To be sure, there wasn't any Home Depot or Lowe's or even a, a Pike's Nursery to, to get what he needed. But he must have had some growing area or some supplier or something in storage. He could have gone to get plants and fertilizer and implements to keep the garden beautiful. The truth of the matter is that the Bible gives us these clues. But beyond, but beyond that, we don't know. What we do know with responsible certainty is that he was fulfilling his responsibility, doing his job. Because he had been there, Mary assumed that he was our Lord. Now that brings me back to the thought we set aside earlier in this sermon, namely the image of Jesus as a gardener. Earlier in John's Gospel, a few days before his crucifixion, Jesus says, unless a grain of wheat is buried in the ground, it never is any more than a grain of wheat. But if it is buried, it sprouts and reproduces itself many times over. Our Lord himself was the first seed which broke ground or was raised in the garden of resurrection. Now he gardens as the cultivator of new life and hope in all who trust and believe. Paul wrote about the disobedience of the first gardener, Adam, who failed and was banished from the garden of Eden. Then God sent a second gardener, even Jesus, to care for us. Unlike the rebellious Adam and the corruption and sin and death and misery which came with him, Jesus was victorious. 
He overcame the trials and tribulations, the sin and disobedience to which Adam succumbed. Mary heard her name called by the gardener Jesus. She knew she had made a mistake in searching for him among the dead. It was clear that the living Lord was searching for her. There are times, as in this COVID-19 dilemma, when we come to worship full of our concerns, our inconveniences, our hurts, and miss the voice of the one who matters. We're so fixed on controlling our future, our lives, our money, our families, our work, that we forget that he wants to cultivate, enrich, sustain, and grow our lives as any good gardener would. He hasn't put down his implements and left the garden of our lives. Could it be that our eyes, our hearts are so tightly closed that we as Mary Magdalene don't see him? Whatever happened to the gardener who Mary Magdalene mistook for our Lord, we don't know. But we do know that Jesus, the gardener of our lives, is still at work planting, watering, cultivating, fertilizing, pruning. The same Jesus who told Zacchaeus to come down from the tree because he was going home with him for dinner. The same Jesus who calmed the storm on the Galilee. The same Jesus who fed the multitudes with a boy's lunch. This is the Jesus who's asking to be the gardener of your life. He's calling your name. Come walk with me in the garden. My mother's favorite hymn was in the garden. Some of those words still live in me. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I'm his own. For the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. Come, Lord Jesus, work in your garden. Work in your garden. As you get out into your garden this week, or you enjoy the garden of springtime that God has provided, realize our Lord is the gardener of your life. Here at Lanier, we always say, you can leave this building, but you can't leave the church. For where you are, there is the church also. My friends, be in the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Love one another. Sin no more. Amen.